Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here's the stories that are trending as we come to air this week. The ARRL Executive Committee is updated on the new entry-level licensing proposal and the amateur radio auxiliary revisions. We will have team coverage of the meeting. It looks like the new digital modes are changing the complexion of the bands and perhaps all of amateur radio. A Tennessee Radio Shack store opens and partners with a local ham radio club. The American Red Cross hails its new partnership with the ARRL following the deployment of hams to Puerto Rico. A major antenna manufacturer ends its production. A new president takes the reins of AMSAT and will have coverage of the social media frenzy being caused by this weekend's Department of Defense communications drill. All this and this week's propagation forecast are among the stories we'll have for you this week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us about the crack in Wi-Fi WPA encryption, the iPhone calculator problem in iOS 11, and the burn-in issue with the Pixel 2. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will explain how radio signals don't travel in a straight line. And we will have part two of a talk given at the 2017 Hamvention by Mitch Stern, W2VU, on what you should bring to a public service event. That's all straight ahead as edition number 975 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in Albany, New York, where we often surf the vast silence often heard across the two-meter band, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where fall has finally arrived, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from the Rancho Lumbago in the Catskill Mountains, where there's a crick in the back, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. 20 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news, the ARRL Executive Committee reviewed plans to implement recommendations by the Entry-Level License Committee when it met on October 14th in Hartford, Connecticut. At its July meeting, the ARRL Board of Directors called for work to go forward on a plan to pursue additional HF digital and phone privileges for technician licensees. The executive committee was told that New England Director and Entry-Level License Committee Chair Tom Freene, K1KI, will work with ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, and International Affairs Vice President Jay Bellows, K0QB, to develop the specifics of a proposal for the FCC requesting expanded frequency and mode privileges for technicians. This will be completed in time for review by the full board of directors at its January meeting. Brene explained this week that enhancing the technician license would be an immediate step that can take place with little FCC impact since the question pool would not need to be changed. He pointed out, however, that this approach does not rule out longer term consideration of a new entry level license. The Entry-Level License Committee had recommended both steps in its July report to the board. The Executive Committee also heard a brief report on the work of the Ad Hoc Amateur Auxiliary Study Committee, which has prepared the first draft of a new training manual. The committee is awaiting feedback from the FCC on a proposed Memorandum of Understanding for the Amateur Auxiliary. The chair of the study panel, ARRL Second Vice President Brian Malchowski, and 5ZGT told the executive committee that several topics related to in-house management of the program must still be resolved and the committee hopes to have the revised amateur auxiliary package ready for consideration by the ARRL board of directors at its January meeting. The executive committee requested the programs and services committee to undertake an evaluation of all ARRL membership program offerings in coordination with the administration and finance committee. The action followed a recommendation from ARRL CEO Tom Gallagher, NY2RF. The Programs and Services Committee is to report back to the Executive Committee next fall. In his CEO report, Gallagher highlighted the efforts of the Force of 50, the ARRL Amateur Radio Volunteers deployed to Puerto Rico 
which he told the committee were assembled and equipped within 48 hours of the initial request from the American Red Cross for volunteers. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, who chaired the meeting, expressed pride in the league's efforts to provide hurricane relief to Puerto Rico and requested that Gallagher relay the executive committee's appreciation to the headquarters staff for its efforts to assist with hurricane relief efforts. Now with more on the ARRL Executive Committee meeting activity, here's Will Rogers, K5WLR. Will? Thanks, Rich. Other business covered at the latest ARRL Executive Committee meeting, the Executive Committee directed the League's CEO, Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, who serves as its secretary, to call a special meeting of the ARRL Board of Directors this fall to consider recommendations from the Ethics and Elections Committee and related items. Executive Committee Member and Hudson Division Director Mike Lysenko, N2YBB, told the panel that the legislative team is continuing to work all avenues to secure passage and implementation of S-1534, the Amateur Radio Parity Act of 2017. The committee asked ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, to work with ARRL Resources to develop recommendations for possible deregulation of the amateur service rules. The Technology Advisory Council in August issued a public notice inviting comments identifying FCC technical rules that may be obsolete or ripe for change in light of current communication technologies. The committee directed Imlay to prepare and file a request for an FCC declaratory ruling asking the Commission to correct discrepancies between Part 73, which regulates broadcasting, and Part 97, which governs amateur radio. Section 73.102, Paragraph 7, Subpart C, allows a broadcaster to retransmit an amateur service signal without the licensee's consent. Section 97.113, subpart B, largely prohibits any form of broadcasting and prohibits amateur stations from engaging in any activity related to program production or news gathering for broadcasting purposes except in certain emergency situations. Minutes of the October 14, 2017 meeting of the ARRL Executive Committee have been posted on the ARRL website. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The wave of software-based digital modes over the past several years has altered the atmosphere of the HF bands. With a look at these new modes and their impact on the bands, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. Some suggest a popularity of modes that make it possible to contact stations neither operator can even hear has resulted in fewer CW and SSB signals on bands like 6 meters and 160 meters. Traditional modes require far more interaction and effort on the part of the operator. The newer digital modes, not so much. The recent advent of the Still Beta Quick FT8 mode, developed by Steve Frankie, K9AN, and Joe Taylor, K1JT, has brought this to a head. Some now wonder if FT8 marks the end of an era and the start of a new, more minimalist age. Joe Taylor told ARRL this week, quote, We've been as surprised as anyone about the rapid uptake of FT8 for making QSOs on the HF bands. SSB and CW are general purpose modes. They are good for rag chewing, DXing, contesting, emergency communications, or whatever. FT8 and the other modes and WSJTX are special purpose modes. They are designed for making reliable, error-free contacts using very weak signals. In particular, signals that may be too weak for the more traditional modes to be usable or even too weak to hear." Close quote. Taylor notes that the information exchanged in most FT8, JT65, and other digital mode contacts is little more than the bare minimum for what's considered to be a valid contact. In addition to call signs and signal reports, stations may exchange grid squares and acknowledgments. As Joe sees it, FT8 won't replace modes such as CW or SSB. However, he said, quote, Nevertheless, it's clear that, at least in the short term, many hams enjoy making rapid-fire minimal QSOs with other hams all over the world using modest equipment. For this purpose, FT8 shines, close quote. 
Radio amateurs recently commented in response to a top band reflector post in which Steve Ireland, VK6VZ, averred that because of FT8, 160-meter DXing has changed, perhaps forever, in recent weeks. Ireland says he downloaded FT8, but just couldn't bring himself to use it on the air. My heart isn't in it, he wrote. My computer will be talking to someone else's computer, and there will be no sense of either a particular person's way of sending CW or the tone of their voice. The human in radio has somehow been lost. In his blog, Stephen McDonald, VE7SL, compiled not only Ireland's posts, but some of their responses to it, although not identified by name or call sign. One commenter suggested that the game-changing aspect of FT8 is that those who typically operate CW or sideband will gravitate to FT8. The amount of activity on the FT8 frequency of any band is phenomenal, the commenter observed. A few complain that no skill is involved in making contacts using the computer-based digital mode. Another suggested that FT8 is already falling victim of its own success, with too many stations crowding around the designated FT8 frequencies. Others were more philosophical, with remarks along the lines of this one. It's allowing people to have smaller stations the opportunity to get on and use their radios and a computer to make contacts they would never have been able to make. This is great fun for ham radio. In a related lightning talk at the 2017 ARRL TAPR Digital Communications Conference earlier this year, ARRL contributing writer Ward Silver in Zero AX challenged his savvy audience to develop a keyboard to keyboard mode between FT8 and PSK31 that would support casual and competitive operating, be more interference and noise tolerant, and be usable by those with compromised stations and antennas. He also challenged his listeners to develop a smart spectrum display that would identify signals by mode so amateur radio could move away from the practice of setting aside specific frequencies for digital modes. The Citizen Tribune newspaper in Tennessee recently reported that a newly reopened Radio Shack store in Jefferson City has partnered with the Lakeway Amateur Radio Club to offer licensing classes. Manager Reed Frears also created a new addition to the store, which he has described as the maker's space, the newspaper said. This open area of the store will be home to classes in such subjects as soldering, using drones, setting up a Facebook page, and configuring and using a smartphone. These types of programs were dropped by Radio Shack years ago, Frears told the newspaper. Now we have the opportunity to bring them back. We have to get to the next generation. Radio Shack will die out if we don't get to them. The bankrupt Radio Shack has closed its company-owned retail outlets. For your store was among the last to go dark. He was given the opportunity to reopen as a franchise store, however, and he purchases his stock from a Radio Shack distribution center. On a personal note, I wish him all the best of luck as I have fond memories of buying my first amateur radio from my local Radio Shack. The American Red Cross this week thanked ARRL and its force of 50 hurricane recovery volunteers who deployed to Puerto Rico earlier this month, and it suggested a new level of partnership now exists between the two organizations. For more details on this story, we go to Carla Perara, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Red Cross Senior Vice President of Disaster Cycle Services, Harvey Johnson, this week wrote to ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, and ARRL CEO Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, to express his organization's gratitude for, quote, all your amazing volunteers for the unwavering commitment demonstrated during the response to this unprecedented disaster in Puerto Rico, close quote. Johnson said the team's actions made a significant difference in the lives of those affected. The ARRL and the American Red Cross have a long-standing memorandum of understanding to cooperate in emergencies and disasters. Johnson continued, quote, It was a complex cooperation in an austere environment, and the mission certainly had its challenges. While we have much to learn from this new experience and areas to improve on, we remain committed to working with you, ARRL, and your cadre of talented volunteers, close quote. This mission marked an exciting new path for our two organizations, with it being the first time we deployed ARRL volunteers to a Red Cross relief operation, Johnson wrote. 
I continue to hear incredible stories about how the ARRL volunteers supported individuals, communities, and partner organizations during their time in Puerto Rico. Johnson singled out for special praise ARRL Emergency Response Manager Mike Corey, KI1U, for his leadership in planning and managing the mission. Mike was fast acting and thoughtful, constantly working to make the mission effective through transparency and collaboration, Johnson said. We simply could not have achieved the outcomes without him. Johnson said the ARC looks forward to working together with ARRL to serve those impacted by disasters. Known worldwide, Polar Electronics Industries of Australia, the designers and manufacturer of quality communication antennas for 41 years, has closed, leaving a gap for the radio amateur community. It serves 51 countries with quality products. Polar especially supported the amateur radio need for special non-standard antennas outside the usual commercial frequency range. Among the Polar products covering 2 MHz to 2.9 GHz, were communications antennas, multi-couplers, duplexers, and accessories. Retirement of its two engineers and its owners was given as the cause for the closure. Based at Morabin in Melbourne South, it had extensive engineering and test facilities, including computer-aided radiation measuring equipment. Through research and development, it remained an industry leader. The directors, Ben Cernovitz and Neville Sleep, were always at the ready to provide special products for mountaintop repeaters, using the heavy-duty methods of standard commercial frequency antennas. WIA repeater and beacon coordinator Peter Mill, VK3APO, said he had found nothing matches the ruggedness and longevity of polar antennas, and the loss of that source with its excellent customer service has come as a surprise and shock. The decision affects a lot of repeater owners throughout Australia and beyond. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Bob Allison, WB1GCM. He's the ARRL Laboratory Assistant Manager. And Bob, I wanted to talk about product review as it appears in QST. Mm -hmm. And when a transceiver shows up, the box lands on your desk, I presume. What's next? I unpack the box, and then I perform a, a long list of tests, which are all available to see uh, on our procedure manual, which is available online. So I'll go through a long, long list of tests and uh, you know, write down all the data. Then when that's all done, of course, I uh, type all the data and, and present it to Mark Wilson. And what if you find a problem uh, with the radio? Hmm, you know, that does happen. Uh, Occasionally, uh, if I find a problem that the manufacturer doesn't know about, I let them know right away and I share the test data with them. And uh, quite often they're quite happy to know about that problem so they can improve their, their product. On a few occasions, I remember, and without mentioning names, we run into, uh, not with transceivers, but uh, with some other uh, things that we test, a safety problem or two, correct? Oh, sure. Yes, that does happen. Uh, for instance, um, we have uh, an amplifier of a manufacturer I'll not name that uh, I got the I got the amplifier in. Of course, it runs off a of 220. I plugged it in, turned it on, and nothing happened. So, gee, I'm wondering, really, what's wrong? It's a brand new amplifier. So, um, I popped the cover off of it. Usually, we don't take the covers off; we just ship it back. But how how hard could it be that it didn't work? So, I popped the cover off, and I found that the uh, electrical wiring to the amplifier from the 220 from the outlet was um, just a bunch of bare wires uh, dangling around inside the chassis. Oh, yeah, 220, geez. so it was like a fraction of an inch away from the chassis, the hot lead uh, that was bare copper wire. So that was a safety factor that I found. <laughs> I, I would guess so. Well, thank you, Bob. We all thank you. <laughs> The CQ Worldwide DX Contest on single sideband kicked off the fall contest season this past weekend with plenty of activity from around the world. As the Daily DX reported on October 30th, some top 10 operations from outside the U.S. racked up claimed scores topping 30 million points. In the U.S., it appears that only two major multi-operator, multi-transmitter high-power entities, K3LR and W3LPL, were active in this year's event with Tim Duffy, K3LR and his 15-member crew 
claiming another big win and a world high in the MMHP category. Duffy's K3LR and Frank Donovan's W3LPL have sparred for high score honors during many contests over the years. K3LR has won every U.S. multi-multi category in the CQ Worldwide phone starting in 2005, Duffy told the ARRL. And earning 20.1 plus million points at K3LR, 15 meters edged out 20 as the money band, with 40 meters only a few hundred contacts behind. K3LR managed 372 contacts in 21 zones on 10 meters. In all, K3LR logged 9,631 contacts in 174 zones or 650 countries. Donovan said W3LPL was handicapped this time around due to the fact that some of the regulars were not able to make it this year. The W3LPL gang posted a not-too-shabby score of 15.2 million points, with 20 meters being the most fertile territory there. W3LPL picked up 438 QSOs in 18 zones on 10 meters, the W3LPL team logged 7,686 contacts in 157 zones or 606 countries. We had lots of fun at K3LR, Duffy said. The very best part is being with good friends in the K3LR shack and talking to our radio friends all over the world. 48 hours of pure magic that never gets old. Duffy also congratulated the W3LPL operators, who he said did well considering the challenging conditions and the operators that had to cancel at the last minute. Quote, it's great to have this close competition, never knowing who will finish on top. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the ARRL Audio News Propagation Forecast for Friday, November the 3rd. A coronal hole is opened in the sun's atmosphere, and you know what that means. Another blast of solar particles are heading our way at more than 600 kilometers an hour. The stream will reach us by Friday, but some believe we might get a glancing blow rather than a head-on shot. Even so, expect some disruptions on the HF bands at times, but not long-lasting major storms. There is a small spot on the sun, but it's fading rapidly. In fact, uh, it may be gone by the time you hear this. So we should be free of flares for a while. In fact, we may be in for another blank sun over the next several days or longer. For the VHF crowd, California is still the place to be for tropospheric ducting in the week to come, and this pattern may extend into Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here's Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. There are times when tower jobs we need to do require helpers assisting us on the ground and with us on the tower. These are special situations which require higher than normal levels of communication between team members. When hauling coax, antennas, sidearms, or other hardware up the tower, never hoist hardware up the tower with someone underneath the cargo, unless they're wearing the proper safety gear and have been trained in tower work. Let's face it, on a tower, you don't get a second chance. There are at least three sides to each tower. So keep the lower climber on a different side. And besides, a freestanding tower is happier when you spread the load more evenly. So before you start to do tower work with other climbers and ground crew, stop, take a moment, and discuss with everyone exactly what you intend to do, the goals to accomplish, the order the tasks will be done in, special hardware you may need, and a discussion about hoisting things up and down the tower. The guy on the ground should always have the job of keeping sidewalk supervisors away from the base area of the tower. Even a quarter 20 zinc plated nut falling 80 feet onto the top of an unprotected skull can leave a permanent dent, not to mention a thud that will be ringing for hours in the victim's head. There's a good argument here for wearing a hard hat. Few hams I know of own one or even know where to buy one, so the next best thing is only one person climbing at a time. If climbing with a person already strapped on working above you, choose a different side to climb on. If you're already on the tower, but the antenna you need to work on is like six feet out on a sidearm, a different set of rules apply. It is most likely that the sidearm is fully capable of holding your weight as is. My personal rule is to never totally trust any part of the tower. This includes sidearms. So I bring along my trusty 15 foot strap. This yellow strap is very lightweight, but fully capable of pulling a snowbound car out of a ditch. I attach one end of this strap to my harness and the other to a tower leg about five feet or more above the point where the sidearm mounts. This strap is strong enough to catch the full weight of the sidearm, myself, and my cargo. 
If you're expecting to work on a sidearm, I strongly recommend you invest in one of these rescue type straps. Not only did I want this series to offer safety tips, I also wanted to offer hints to make the job go faster and easier. The way I figure, an easier climb is bound to be a safer climb. So let's cover a couple of quick hints. For your tower work, attach them to a short piece of fishing line. Use the woven multi-filament type. Make it long enough to tie a wrist strap in the other end. And tie the other end to the tool you don't wish to drop. If you have a friend with a leather working hobby, a good Christmas present would be a whole bunch of these straps. You can keep your tool securely on your arm and in your hand with one of these straps. Remember to order them large enough to fit around your arm when you're wearing cold weather climbing gear. Another one of my favorites is my coaxial cable hanger. I bent the hook in a piece of reinforcing steel bar, the type used in concrete work and often sold at hardware stores. I bent a squared hook in one end, about three inches over and five inches back down, sort of like a giant fishing hook. I use electrical tape to hold the coax onto the rod that I'm bringing up the tower as I climb. I secure about two feet of the coax to the rod. As I climb, I reach down, grab the hook and lift it to a tower rung up as high as I can reach. Don't forget a short piece of rope to secure the coax hook to a loop on your climbing belt just in case you might drop it. Some people like to lift coax after they get to the antenna that it connects to. I've had problems with coax damage doing it this way, so this has worked fine for me. I stretch out the coax on the ground and the crew helps feed it up to me as I climb further. This would probably not work on very long lengths and may be unnecessary on shorter towers. Remember, any time you spend learning about tower safety is an investment in yourself. Education is a big part of tower safety. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Let's talk tech, you and me. We're having a fun time. This is like a little user group here. That's kind of always what I thought of this radio show as being uh, a chance for. That's what user groups were. In the very earliest days of computers, the companies really didn't give you any help or support. And so computer lovers who were in many cases building their own computers got together in uh, Silicon Valley and Berkeley, California and Boston. And the big user groups were born, and there were some amazing ones. Of course, the Homebrew Computer Club is where the Apple was introduced. The Apple One, Steve Woz, Wozniak and uh, Steve Jobs were members. They showed it there. Steve Wozniak sold kits for the first Apple One to the Homebrew Computer Club. And there, and in the in the heyday of user groups, I'm thinking of the Berkeley Macintosh users group, and there was one in Boston too. There would they would have meetings uh, with hundreds of people, and vendors uh, would would you know kill to go there and show off their stuff and they were, they were so much fun i think b mug was every it was like a third thursday of the month and it was just an amazing event to go to but members of users group aged out the young people i guess just didn't feel the need with modern technology there's no you know snapchat user group <laughs> they have their own user groups they talk amongst themselves i don't know and so they're they tend to be shrinking they tend to be aging and i think they're still very useful but in a way, that's what we do here. We help each other. It hasn't changed much. Technology is still hard to use. Companies still don't really give you much help. And so that's what we're doing. We get together and we help our, help each other. Another thing we talk about a lot on the show, and I'm sorry we have to talk about it again, is, uh, is security flaws. The crack flaw with a K, K-R-A-C-K, is a flaw in the encryption your Wi-Fi uses. And uh, it's pretty serious. For a long time, we told you, uh, I've been telling you for 10 years, don't use WEP, WEP encryption on your Wi-Fi, because that's uh, insecure. It's been, it was cracked almost out of the box. Use WPA2. That's, oh, that's the good stuff. That's the gold standard. In fact, that's all you need to do to secure your Wi-Fi. Wrong, turns out. Mm -mm. It, uh, it has a problem. A uh, young, young security researcher named Matty Van Hoff discovered that uh, you can... But what's interesting is, and I think this might be misrepresented sometimes in the media, it it's not your access point that's the problem, not your router. It's the things that connect to your router. You don't need to patch your router. You need to patch your phone, your laptop, the things that connect to the Wi-Fi, your internet cameras, 
your internet ovens, your internet doorbells, all of those things need to be fixed. If not, then somebody who is within range of your Wi-Fi sitting on your curb or next to you in the coffee shop can easily get in the middle and see what that device is sending back. Not such a big deal, if, you know, if it's your oven. <laughs> they can see what you're cooking. Might be a big deal if it's a internet connected camera. They can see into your house. And certainly the traffic coming from your phone or laptop uh, on an access point, well, that we'd like to hide. And we thought we could. Although it's always been an issue, right, with open Wi-Fi access points. People have always uh, worried about that. And have, we've recommended the use of virtual private networks or VPNs. Those will protect you against the crack attack as well. And all this stuff is going to be patched. Turns out Windows and iOS didn't, didn't implement the WPA2 protocol quite right. And so they're not vulnerable. Still, they're getting patched. And even your router will probably get some patches. Most importantly, if you have one of those mesh routers... You know, the Eero and the uh, Orbi and the routers that have uh, satellites that they connect to, they're vulnerable because the satellites are clients. They're connecting to the router. So they're vulnerable as well. So you will want to look for patches. Look for Android updates too. Android needs to be patched. Not a nice one. Not a nice one. Uh, kind of a surprise even. A lot of people unhappy with iOS 11 on the iPhone. Apple seems to be really... Ah, maybe is it my imagination, but I think part of the problem is com computers and phones are much more reliable than they used to be. See, I, I mean, if you go back to uh, Windows 95, you'll remember constant blue screens of death. But then we went, you know, we, we improved it and, 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 and it got more reliable. Your Macintosh more reliable, doesn't crash as much. Uh, iPhones have been very reliable. Android phones, very reliable. So when they do crash, it's a big deal. When they don't work right, it's a big deal. So in a way, I can't really beat them up for poor quality control because they've they you know the standards higher now. They they really are much more reliable than they used to be. But it's bad when you get an iOS update and it breaks things. That's not that's not good. And and little things, you know, one of the, one of the stories that Apple's getting a lot of heat for, and it's it is a very minor thing, is their calculator. The calculator on the uh, on iOS 11, and I think this might have happened with earlier uh, versions of the iPhone, is very pretty. It's designed to be pretty, and it has animations. When you touch a button, it it the colors change, and it's beautiful. But there's a problem with those animations. It doesn't register key presses until the animation is done. So you can't use the Apple calculator quickly because it'll give you bad results. If you do 1 plus 2 plus 3 very quickly, <laughs> you'll get some unknown number, which is a combination of 1 plus 2 plus 3. And I just did it. I got 21. Now, I know 1 plus 2 plus 3 does not equal 21. Here's the problem. If you're doing a lot of numbers on the calculator and you're still careful, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus... There might be at one point, one moment where you did a little, little fast and you got an error in there and you won't really know. Your number will be wrong at the end because you just were. So I don't think a calculator where you have to wait in between key presses is a very good design. But that's what Apple put out. And to me, that's a bug, like a massive bug, because you won't even know about it. And, and uh, you know, if people hadn't publicized this, they would nobody would know. A calculator that doesn't get the right result because you used it too quickly on a modern phone. This is the fastest chip ever put in an iPhone on the iPhone 8. It's the A11 Bionic. It is as fast as a laptop computer. But it can't, the calculator is too slow to be used at a normal speed? Come on, man. <laughs> That's crazy. So, yes, iPhones are. In general, more reliable, they crash less. Computers are generally more reliable, they crash less. But I do have to, I have to ding a company where they pay so little attention to details like that, that that stuff is released. Especially after extended beta testing with many, many people, and you still have that problem. That's not okay. That's not acceptable. That really, and it's, it's, they should be embarrassed. That should be embarrassing to Apple, that they would release something like that. So I guess I have to ding them. For that and uh, it's not just apple every you know there's this rush to get stuff out software is harder to do than ever before and 
we see bugs. But we, I, I guess I expect more of Apple, and that's why it hurts more, right? You expect Apple to, to do it right, to be the best. That's why you're paying a premium for their hardware. They, they set a, supposedly set a higher standard. But your calculator doesn't work? Come on. If your calendar freezes when you try to hit a location? Come on. That's absurd. <laughs> That's just not right. Why aren't they more embarrassed by that? I laugh at Google's response to the Pixel 2 XL burn-in issue. They don't, they said, what we, we call that, we don't call that burn-in. The, the term they use is differential aging. <laughs> well, burn-in has a bad connotation. Differential aging just confuses people. What they're trying to say or what they're, they're, the euphemism is that parts of the screen are aging faster than other parts, differential aging. But everybody else knows it as burn-in. I guess it's not inaccurate to call it differential aging, but I think it obscures the problem. And, uh, you know, they don't disagree that it's happening, but they say it's in line with other premium smartphones and should not affect the normal day-to-day -day experience. Nobody's denying that it affects the day-to-day -day experience. Or uh, nobody's asserting that it affects the day-to-day -day experience. I mean, you know, it's it's a faint burn-in. It's not a big black dot on your screen. But if you're watching a movie and you still see the kind of ghost on the right of the home button, that's not ideal, especially for a premium-priced phone. So I, I think people's complaint is reasonable. I don't know if it would bother me or not. I, I will let you know when I get the phone. But it'll be interesting to see if Google can figure it out. Maybe it's a particular batch of OLED screens or maybe, you know, LG does have a more modern factory coming online to make these OLED screens. Maybe that'll solve the problem. But Google says, well, you know, as, as with any big company, and this is a VP product management for Google hardware, uh, Mario Quiroz, who says, we're confident the Pixel 2 delivers an exceptional smartphone experience and to give users a peace of mind, we're doubling the warranty. Okay, well, that's kind of an acknowledgement. Regardless, we use software to safeguard the user experience and maximize the life of the OLED display. We will make ongoing software updates to optimize further. So maybe they can figure it out and make it better. If they do, it probably is a very good choice for the phone. If you can live with the missing headphone jack, which I'm not crazy about. The, I have to say at this point, the Note 8 looks like the, the phone to get. But I was just checking my Note 8. Very disappointing. It doesn't have the last two months of Android patches, the security updates. My Note 8 anyway which is, uh, I think it's an unlocked Note 8, only goes through August. That means it's not, it's not, it doesn't have the September or October patches. And of course, a very important patch is coming to Android devices in the next week or two, probably for the November update, to fix the crack exploit, which is a serious flaw in the way a Wi-Fi works and could impact your privacy on a Wi-Fi network. This is, a, but there are other important patches too. I mean, there's lots of them. And missing, you know, two months behind is not, is not a good thing either. On the other hand, Samsung has certainly figured out how to make an OLED display pop, look good without burn-in. I love it. It has a headphone jack. It has a stylus. It's got wireless charging, which the new Google phones lack. So if you, if you, if you feel like, well, I'm, just, I'm not confident that the Google XL, 2XL problems will be solved, and you, or, you, or you want a headphone jack, which certainly I do, uh, then a Note 8 is a very good choice. There are other good phones out there, too. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. That's a good question, and that's something that clubs need to say is, can you run that repeater indefinitely if you have a really big disaster? Mitch Stern, W1SJ, one of the more entertaining forum speakers you'll hear at the Dayton Hamvention. Mitch has participated in many public service events and DX contests, and he's a most gregarious ham who has many a pointer for the new ham as heard here last week. Here in the second excerpt from his 2017 Hamvention talk, Mitch pontificates, oh, there's a 25-cent word for you, on some do's and don'ts for using your handheld in a public service event. So let's talk about public service operating. As a public service operator, your number one job is to communicate. That's what you do. You're not 
supposed to sit there and talk to people and direct traffic. You're there to talk on the radio. If you want to do other things, fine, but don't mess up talking on the radio. And I tell my operators this, when I call you, I better hear an answer within seconds or I'm going to be upset. And the number one ability is to listen. So you have to listen so you know when I'm calling you. You know when I need information. You must gather and organize information quickly. It's like in a marathon. Something happens. It will be one of two scenarios. I'm asking you, what's the situation down there? Are you supplied? What's going on? Is all hell breaking loose? I want to know that. And you know why I want to know that? Because the race director is banging me in the back wanting to know that. That's why I need to know it. I need to know it really quick. And then I get some of the, well, uh, I don't know. I, says, I don't know is not an acceptable answer. No, figure it out. Ask people, hit them over the head with a stick and find out what you need to do because we have 50,000 runners that are going to join you for a party inside of 10 minutes. Something like that. That's why it's important. Think before speaking. Something that probably everyone in this room fails at once in a while, right? What do you want to say first? Instead of rambling and, and trying to think out what it is you want to say, think it out first, then press the microphone button. Okay, the person at the other end will be really appreciative. Transmissions must be short. Just because the repeater has a three-minute timer does not mean you need to test it. In fact, on my repeater, it's two minutes. The only reason why it's two minutes is because it used to be a minute, and everyone would yell at me because they'd always time it out. So I, I said, okay, we'll make it a little longer. But yeah, short. Sure, get right to the point. We want to know what's going on. We don't want a whole story here. You want to tell stories? 80 meters. That's where you tell stories. Always follow the directions of your supervisor, even if he's a jerk or she's a jerk. During the event is not the time to get into it with them. Just follow the directions, and then at the end of the event, you could have a discussion about it, or you cannot do it anymore. But if you get into a fight, either on the air, which is really bad, or even off air, but with other people around, that's bad for all of us. Don't do that. Just kind of bite your lip and deal with it at the time, and then decide going forward what you want to do in the future if you want to work with this person or not or do something different. Use your tactical call sign wherever applicable. So that means that like in a marathon, we don't use call signs. We use mile eight or mile 10 or sweep bus or uh, net control or something like that. So that way, instead of hearing a whole alphabet soup of call letters, the name that you give means something to everyone who's listening. But you got to identify every 10 minutes with your real call sign too. Different groups do that. I, I just, every 10 minutes, I say, this is ba 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 for the marathon net, okay, and uh, we'll, we'll pause for identification, and then we just instruct people to just dump their call sign in as needed and get over that part of it. So the equipment you need for public service events. A dead radio is useless. Have backup. You know what, you know what a uh, communicator in a public service event with a dead radio is called? Or a civilian. You're basically no longer useful to the operation. Go home. And batteries follow Murphy's Law. They die when it is least nice to have them die. Okay, so that's why you have a backup. In fact, I have a backup radio or two because stuff happens. You don't want to be taken off the air because of this. So properly charge your batteries. The old Nikads were notorious where you just kept them on charge all the time. They would die. They'd have memory and whatever. The newer lithium ions are not as bad, but you should still cycle the battery down and bring it back up just to make sure that it has reserve. Learn how to fully operate your equipment. So I tell people in, in our thing, we give them the frequencies we're going to be on, program these into memory, and make sure you can change to another frequency, another offset, the right PL, everything on the fly, if we need to do that. Stuff happens. Repeaters blow up. Jammers occur. All that stuff we may have to change. I don't want you sitting there asking everyone, oh, how do I program my ICOM? Make sure you have yourself your little cheat notes on how to change the frequency. As hams, we look really dumb when that happens. Did you get your Baofeng program, Tony? No, no right? So, <laughs> I mean, we had this problem last year with a different guy who had, had one of those radios. You, you just can't put the offset in. It's not anything that anyone can figure out. There's only like maybe a select group of five people on the planet that know how to make those radios work, unless you have a computer. So you want to be able to fully operate your equipment. That's really, really important in these. Use the higher power and best antenna possible. So no QRP. Run that HT up to its highest power level. Well, what if the battery don't last? Bring extra batteries. 
because you have a thing where a runner is running and the runner trips and falls down and is laying there in a face full of blood. You don't want the net control to say, I didn't get that. Say it again. Don't want to do that. You want to be absolutely reliable copy. Keep the HT off the belt. So people put the HT like on the belt and then they have like the microphone up here. Well, the problem is, is your antenna is right alongside your body. It does two things. One, it attenuates your signal so I cannot hear you. And secondly, which might concern you, is that all that energy from the HD is being transported into your body, causing heating of your body because the human body absorbs RF best right around two meters. You know, if you want to cook yourself for lunch, you should do that. But that's not my problem. My problem is being able to hear you. So that's why you want to take it off your belt. And then what do I do? Well, you can do like some people do around here. You get the hard hat with the antenna sticking up above it. Those work really well. I made one like this about 35 years ago. I got a hard hat, stuck a ground screen inside of it, put the quarter wave whip up. it. thing was great. And this was an event in Manhattan, the worst place for any radios to work. And then someone snapped a picture of me, and I looked like a Prussian general. <laughs> that was the last time that hat was worn. It's still in my basement. I show it to people like, no, no, no. I have to draw the line of when I look totally retarded, I'm just not going to do it. What do you do? How do you make your signal? You take the radio off your belt, hold it in your hand, and talk right into it. Hold the antenna up above your head so it's not in your eyeballs. And now that antenna is in the clear. Nowhere in any of the amateur radio literature do they tell you how to hold an HT. On the technician test, they say, hold it away from your eyes. What, like that? They ain't going to hear you. Like that? Wrong polarization. I'm telling you, hold it up like that and just talk up into it and you'll be great. Forget about what the cops do where they have the uh, antenna and the mic cord and all that. that. The cops don't hear one another half the time anyway. That's why they bring the hams in. True story. So it's really important to be able to use that HT properly because you may not be in the best spot for whatever repeater you're using. Check the coverage before the event. You go there and check the repeater and you need to have a second radio and you walk around, you hear yourself swishing in and out of the repeater and you know where the bad spots are and kind of make a mental note of where not to walk as you're talking. You know, okay, I'm going to stay on this side of the sidewalk, not that side, and they'll be able to hear me better. Do not use Vox. I do not allow Vox in any of my events. What happens is they lock up. Vox and also locking PTT and also VX5s with external microphones. Because VX5 and FT60s have a nasty little habit. When the microphone pulls halfway out, it locks the radio up. And then you got this signal on the repeater. And then, and then everyone comments, there's a signal on the repeater. Uh, yeah, we know that. What are you going to do about it? I says, well, if I wasn't busy, I'd get my little Yagi out and DF the guy, but I'm um, kind of tied up right now. So we wait for the guy to realize that they're doing this, and they stop it. So that's why we don't allow that kind of thing. And with the Vox, we get hams who are set up next to a band, and the band starts triggering their Vox. Well, can you make that band move? I says, no. I said, you're going to have to move. They're more important than you are. So always use headphones because, yes, that band's playing. Not only are you going to be rebroadcasting what they're playing, you ain't going to hear anything because they're playing some pretty loud stuff. Well, can't you get them to make it lower? No. You're going to have to use good headphones. What this comes down to with public service events crossing over into bona fide emergencies, there's no clear answer. So I'm going to ask some questions, and you get to answer the questions for yourself. If you're suddenly called into action, is your equipment ready and the battery charged? How many have the batteries charged and ready to go right now? That's not even half the room. We don't get advance warning when disasters strike. It's not like we get a text saying, there's going to be a disaster tomorrow at noon. It doesn't happen that way. So you want to be ready to go. You want to have equipment ready to roll out the door. Now, yes, if the disaster happens right after hamvention, when all your batteries are worn down from a weekend of talking, yeah, that could be a problem. If power and phone were out for weeks, not for a day, not for two days, for weeks, would you be able to communicate? How are you going to charge your batteries? Well, I'll start up the car and try. Yeah, well, do you have gas for the car? Where are you going to get gas from if all the power is out? I don't know what the answer You know, you get a little hand crank operation there and charge the battery. Yeah, and that's one way of doing it. But, yeah, how do you do that? Interesting question. Can the repeater you stay on for over a week without commercial power? We had a test of this in New York City. Remember that big outage that started out here somewhere? Well, those lines went down and it went clear across Ohio, across New York State, and it stopped at the Vermont border. I live in Vermont. They, there was an operator there who was not watching TV that moment and kicked out the plug, and we were spared. 
So all the emergency guys in New York all got together and they got on the repeater, except the Aries repeater did not have backup power. So they're all trying to work simplex. And then other repeaters that had backup power, and when their batteries died, maybe eight hours later, those went off the air too. How many repeaters? Out of 400 repeaters in the New York City area, how many were left on the air? I think two. Two guys that actually had a repeater at their house with full generator. That's a good question, uh, and that's something that clubs need to say is, can you run that repeater indefinitely if, if you have a really big disaster? Do you have ways to power your radios and charge batteries without power? All right, and finally, the most important one, will you be emotionally able to help if disaster struck your area directly? The answer is probably no. In fact, what happens is, is that you are the victim. You're not the communicator. We bring in what's called jump teams to come in and do the communications. You've got other problems like looking for relatives and family members and trying to get out of the area safely. But this is the important thing. And you have to make that decision. Which is more important, talking on the radio and helping the effort or doing what you need to do to make sure everyone's safe? And that concludes our two excerpts from a 2017 Dayton Hamvention talk by avid contester and inveterate public service participant Mitch Stern, W1SJ. His ideas and opinions are his own and don't necessarily reflect those of anyone connected with the RAIN report. Having said all that, Mitch is indeed an entertaining and, at times, even thoughtful speaker. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Radio amateurs should keep up with modern times, so says South African Radio League. Radio amateurs made their mark in history when they discovered worldwide HF communications on using radio telegraphy, which is the correct term for CW. Ten years later, they discovered VHF propagation beyond the line of sight to the surprise of the radio experts. Our early radio amateurs were true experimenters, researchers and pioneers, and they advanced amateur radio technology in their time. Today, many of our modern breed of radio amateurs are no longer interested in experimenting, but only having fun with radio as a hobby. As the SARL point out, many shortwave broadcasting stations have closed and commercial stations relocated to the satellite frequencies on SHF, where DSTV is well established. This includes the maritime mobile service that used many HF bands and radio telegraphy on their sea lanes until they also moved to satellite and now communicate via voice and digital. It's now the VHF, UHF and SHF spectrum that's now in great demand by the commercial radio world. All this does not mean that radio amateurs should abandon HF on CW, but rather we should try and keep up with radio developments to increase their knowledge in the VHF spectrum and the frequencies above where the future of radio lies, including the digital communications. The IARU is already concerned about the lack of interest in amateur radio by the younger generations, and if it stops growing, then its survival is doubtful. The younger generations are very computer literate, and their interests are a lot different to the old timers of yesteryear, and the RAE should reflect on it. Amateur radio service needs a renaissance. The first step is to break away from this hobby attitude and to realise that it's an amateur radio science, which is to experiment, research and pioneer. Secondly, the amateur radio service should broaden its field to include radio astronomy for future space communications, which currently can cover communications distances of more than 21 billion kilometres from Earth. A wider radio field enhanced by the latest radio technology will be more exciting, attractive and have a far greater appeal to the new generations with their open inquiring minds. They'll become fully exposed to the new era of space travel within the next decade, and this could extend their lifespan of amateur radio service for another 100 years. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. There was a lot of really great information at the AMSAT Symposium this past week. One of the best announcements was about the future of AMSAT satellites. As the five Fox satellites are nearing final launch in the near future, there has to be something else. That something else is the next in the alphabet, GULF. GULF is the acronym for Great Orbit Larger Footprint. AMSAT is going to work on launching satellites into different orbits such as LEO, MEO, 
or medium Earth orbit, geo or geosynchronous orbit, and heo or highly elliptical orbit. All the orbits except LEO will give a much larger footprint. AMSAT North America Vice President of Engineering Jerry N0JY said, quote, The Gulf T project tees off with the next phase of our CubeSat program. Gulf T provides AMSAT hardware and knowledge for attitude determination and control or ADAC capability and the opportunity to develop a 3U space frame with deployable solar panels that can be used in LEO or HEO missions, two of the major systems required in future Gulf and HEO missions." Unquote. This is exciting news and there will be more to follow, especially as to what the T means. Is it really the letter T or T-E-E? -E? Stay tuned. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO, Foundations of Amateur Radio. The other day, a friend of mine asked a really silly question. How come when I point my Yagi at a direction for a station using the Great Circle, the signal is there, but weak? But when I point it in a different direction, say 20 degrees away from the Great Circle, the signal improves. Being a good little amateur, I responded with the logical explanation. Well, two things come to mind. One being that you're not pointing where you think you're pointing, that is, north on your antenna isn't north in reality, so when you point at the other station it's not actually where you're pointing, and when you adjust the antenna ends up in the correct direction. Another explanation I came up with is that the pattern of their Yagi isn't what they expect. There might be local factors that influence the pattern, putting weird distortions into their footprint, and making for interesting nulls where there should be signal and vice versa. That, in turn, started a whole conversation about directions and where stations are. Leaving aside the difference between long path and short path, which I should probably talk about at some point, an antenna should get signal from the direction in which you point it, right? So what if I told you that the antenna was in fact pointing correctly, and there were no distortions in the antenna pattern? What then? Turns out the ionosphere isn't uniform. Who'd have predicted that? In case you're wondering, that's a joke. The ionosphere isn't uniform. It takes in many and varied influences from the Earth's magnetic field, to heating by the sun, to solar storms, coronal mass ejections, and any number of factors that we as a species are only just beginning to discover. If you imagine for a moment a radio wave coming up from your antenna, bouncing against the ionosphere back to Earth, then bouncing back up, then doing the same thing again, you'll quickly understand that because the ionosphere is variable, the height and angles at which this bouncing is occurring varies along the path. But here's a shocker. Who said that the signal had to bounce up and down vertically? What if the same variability of the ionosphere height caused the signal to bounce in some other weird direction, like at an angle, or sideways? Would the path of the signal from your station to the other end follow a great circle line? Turns out that this silly question wasn't silly at all, and I learned something unexpected. My radio signal isn't a straight line, something which I confess did come as a surprise, but now looking back seems pretty obvious. I love silly questions, they often turn into an opportunity to learn. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima Alpha Bravo. BBC Director General Lord Tony Hall of Birkenhead on October 18th opened the new London BBC Radio Group's G8 BBC, the amateur radio premises, or what we call here in the US, the Shack at the Broadcasting House, the headquarters of the BBC. The shack is in a small room tucked into the roof of Broadcasting House. On opening day, Lord Hall used G8 BBC to send greetings to GB2RN on the HMS Belfast, which is moored on the Thames River. The G8 BBC call sign originally was held by the Ariel Radio Group BBC Club under BBC Engineering. The new group of radio amateurs and shortwave listeners at the BBC are putting the finishing touches on its shack and antenna system on the roof. There are 28 current members, some of whom are BBC on-air talent. We're now testing on the air from our new shack and broadcasting house, the G8 BBC team announced on its QRZ.com profile. Please listen and report our signal. Jonathan Kempster, M5AEO, is the G8 BBC secretary and station manager. Amateur radio operators will descend upon 630 meters on November 11th during a special operating event to commemorate the 1906 Berlin Treaty, 
which made 500 kilohertz the international distress frequency on November 3rd of that year. U.S. radio amateurs recently gained access to 630 meters, but must have notified the Utilities Technology Council of their intent to operate and either received explicit approval or not heard anything for 30 days in order to participate. Four different groups will take part, U.S. radio amateurs, U.S. Part 5 experimental operators, Canadian radio amateurs, and the Maritime Radio Historical Society. Canadian and authorized U.S. radio amateurs will operate from 472 to 479 kilohertz using CW. Some stations are expected to offer cross-band contacts, transmitting on 630 meters and listening on 160, 80, and 40 meters. Part 5 experimental operators, including WD2XSH stations and others who don't yet have UTC approval, will operate in the 472 to 479 kilohertz band or just outside of it, and there may be some operation on 500 kilohertz proper. The Maritime Radio Historical Society will activate its KSM KPH transmitter at Bolinas, California for a mini night of nights with special messages and bulletins. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The AMSAT North America Board of Directors has elected Joe Spear, K6WAO of Weimar, California, as the organization's new president. An ARRL and AMSAT life member, Spear, 58, succeeds Barry Baines, WD4ASW, who served as AMSAT president for the past nine years. Spear is a well-known figure in AMSAT and amateur radio satellite circles. He served previously as AMSAT NA Executive Vice President and Vice President for Educational Relations. The board's action came at the AMSAT NA Annual General Meeting in Reno, Nevada, where Spear announced the next phase of AMSAT's CubeSat program called GOLF. GOLF is an acronym for Greater Orbit, Larger Footprint. AMSAT considers the new initiative as a crucial step toward fulfilling AMSAT's strategic goals involving high-altitude, wide-access satellite missions. As an initial step in the GOLF program, AMSAT will be submitting a NASA CubeSat Launch Initiative proposal for the GOLF-T satellite project, which will serve as a rapidly deployable Low Earth Orbit, or LEO, testbed for technologies necessary for successful CubeSat missions in a wide range of orbits, including LEO, medium Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, and highly elliptical orbit. The Golf T project tees off the next phase of our CubeSat program, punned AMSAT NA Vice President Engineering Jerry Buxton, N0JY. Golf T provides AMSAT hardware and knowledge for attitude determination and control capability and the opportunity to develop a 3U space frame with deployable solar panels that can be used in LEO or HEO missions, two of the major systems required in future Golf and HEO missions. AMSAT said Golf T will provide the opportunity for rapid deployment and on orbit testing of AMSAT's advanced satellite communications and exploration of new technology or ASCENT programs technology. ASCENT will include a radiation tolerant transponder and integrated housekeeping unit technologies that, AMSAT says, will lead the way to low cost commercial off the shelf systems that can function in MEO and HEO radiation environments. Golf T will also provide for the development of so called 5 and dime, 5 gigahertz, and 10 gigahertz field programmable gate array software defined radio transponders for use on a variety of missions and orbits. Other officers elected by the board were Paul Stotzer, N8HM, Executive Vice President, Jerry Buxton, N0JY, Vice President Engineering, Drew Glassbrenner, KO4MA, Vice President Operations, Clayton Coleman, W5PFG Secretary, Keith Baker, KB1SF, VA3KSF, Treasurer, and Martha Saragovitz as Manager. 
Bain said it's been an honor to serve as AMSAT NA president and as a board member since 1999. I'm confident that the successes of the past nine years while serving as president will lead to new opportunities in AMSAT's future as Joe assumes the helm working with the new senior leadership team, Bain said. I'm excited that the new board combined with the new senior leadership team will bring insight, enthusiasm, energy, and commitment to move AMSAT forward. <laughs> Produced by amateurs, for amateurs, and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Elements of the U.S. Department of Defense will conduct a communications interoperability training exercise this weekend, once again simulating a very bad day type scenario. Amateur Radio and Mars organizations will take part. WXYZ-TV in Detroit reports on the social media frenzy that followed a press release from the Department of Defense about an emergency planning exercise involving Amateur Radio Mars this weekend. And then a similar report from WFMJ-TV in Ohio. This, the internet is all abuzz with viral videos about looming blackouts tonight. For some, it's based on a misunderstanding, but others are turning it into a straight-up hoax. Seven Action News reporter Andrea Isom live tonight digging to get to the bottom of this. Andrea, truth or hoax? Well, you know what? I'll tell you this, guys. There are probably a lot of people out there panicking tonight, but we talked with a father and son who say there is a very good explanation for all of this. Here it goes. 30 over on the loop, sometimes pressing 40. I think it's just a lot of conspiracy theory. I don't know why anybody's trying to scare, you know, the nation. I've been hearing about it on Facebook all day. Scores of viral videos are soaring all over social media, and many of them are causing a mountain of mass hysteria, like this one from two women from Michigan. But November 4th through the 6th, there will be an electronic magnetic pulse going through the entire continent of North America. It all stems from a press release from the Department of Defense. In it, describes a very bad day scenario, an exercise, a simulation. But loads of people are thinking it's something else, something more sinister, like no landlines, no cell phones, no computers, no power. Zilch. That's going to impact the power grid and knock everything out. But this father and son say that is not it at all, folks. What it is, according to these amateur ham operators, is a communication training with the amateur radio community and Mars, the military auxiliary radio system. What happens? They know. The Department of Defense is going to be uh, conducting a test between November 4th and 6th that could shut down the entire United States electronic grid. The operative word here is test, not a real shutdown, a drill, if you will. Realistically, that's what amateur radio is all about, is when something really does happen, I uh, want to be able to get the message out to other people. So if there were a real very bad day. Everything goes down, uh, cell phones, uh, uh, AM, FM radio broadcasts and all that. Uh, we can still get out there with amateur radio, and sometimes with little to no power at all. Another way ham radio could help out? It could be, you know, working uh, communications with hospitals and stuff like that to relay messages back and forth to different counties and all that. Now, just so we're clear, he wants everyone to understand not every ham operator can do this. You have to have an extra certification and license to work with the military this way. And he says people do this because they really, really want to help. Reporting live tonight, I'm Andrea Isom, 7 Action News. All right. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for clearing that up for us. Ham radio is a hobby that's been around more than 100 years. Local operators say this weekend will only be a test with a simulated event which will impact the national power grid. The rumor is that are surrounding this are based on what the simulation is. The simulation is that the grid goes down and so on, but uh, there's no plans to really do it. Brett says it's an annual test conducted between the amateur community and the military. It's a test to make sure that if the military needed to talk to the hams or the hams need to get with the military, that they, they know it works. The hams become key to nationwide communications because generators and battery technology give them backup power. And we can stay on the air with just battery power for quite some time. The operators would be able to communicate vital information to the military from every state and county. What the status is of the power grid, of the sanitation systems, of the water systems, and so on. Ham operators have long been a valuable resource in times of emergencies. A prime example is the recent hurricane in Puerto Rico. 
Yes, uh, we're kind of the first line of communications when the, when the, the uh, infrastructure goes down. The Department of Defense says the average citizen will not even know this weekend's exercise is taking place. With more local news, I'm Glenn Stevens. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.